Hi, I'm Bryce Crittenden. Hi, I'm Caroline Land, and welcome back to EPL's Overdue Finds. Hey, Caroline. How's it going today? It's going really well, Bryce. How are you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, we're recording this on a Monday morning. Yes. And uh, yeah, I had a really, I had a fun weekend. And uh, the weekend started off on such a high note because Friday night, I went to a sold out screening at the Metro Cinema of the new horror movie that's like taking the world by storm. Like it's being buzzed about everywhere. And uh, the coolest part is that it was filmed here in Edmonton by a local crew and cast and and everything, all for like fifteen thousand dollars, which is which is insane. It's like Edmonton's own like Blair Witch project. And uh, of course, I'm talking about the movie uh, Skin of a Rink, uh, Caroline. It was it was awesome. I had a blast, and it was such a great way to kick off the weekend. I know that you were really looking forward to going and seeing this. I want to hear everything about it. Yes, and and we will hear everything about it, and that's because today we've got a special guest joining us today. Um, we've had, obviously, we have, you know, a ton of EPL staff on, and we have, like, we have so many people across the system, and it's always interesting to find out, you know, we all kind of have our day jobs, but, you know, a lot of, a lot of EPL staff, we've got, we've got writers and artists and, and everything that, that work for EPL and we have really talented staff. And uh, just the other week uh, we saw a note pop up on our internal uh, website staff web here. And that uh, one of our colleagues is the associate producer of skin of a rink. So uh, he's also a library assistant at our Stanley A. Milner library, John Kamech. Welcome to overdue fines. How's it going today? Great. Thanks so much, Bryce for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Bryce and Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I saw your your post about Skin of Marink, and I was just like, you know, I had heard about it, and then I read the there was an article in Variety about it. And I reached out to you. I was like, John, we need to have you on the podcast to chat all about this movie. So uh, that's what we're obviously going to be talking all about today is uh, Skin of Marink, and we'll get into the big sold out screening that we just had here on the weekend and how you can watch Skin of Marink. But uh, before we get there. Let's go over our recent overdue finds picks. John, it's your uh, first time joining us here on the show. So uh, what's something that you've enjoyed recently? Uh, so my my favorite album of late um, has been an album by a Canadian punk band um, called White Lung. Uh, I'm a big punk and hardcore fan, and uh, the album is called Premonition, um, which I guess is fitting, you know, for the <laughs> uh, for what we're talking about here. It's their final album. Uh, and they announced that it was their final album. And it, it really is like a, f if you're into punk and hardcore, it's really a phenomenal album. Um, I've kind of been listening it, listening to it like on repeat since it came out in December. <laughs> <laughs> what area of the country are they from? I believe they're from Vancouver. Yes, they're, yeah, they're from Vancouver. Well, hopefully, I'm not sure, do they do tour, like, do they still tour at all? Or that's just kind of, they're, they're wrapping things up here shortly. Yeah, I don't know if I'm not sure, actually even sure if they're touring on this album, a band going out, you know, with a bang. And I think it's it's in the collection, you know, putting on my library assistant hat. I think it's it's at least on order. I checked I checked it's on order, so it'll be in the collection. Nice. That's good. We talk on the show often. Uh Bryce and I can always use music recommendations, especially ones <laughs> from this century. Mm. Uh so we might have to have you back <laughs> sometime to talk about music i'm uh i've talked before i'm a i'm a big i'm a big rock fan and i've said that it seems like it's sadly a genre that it's kind of i don't want to say it's dying off but it's you know i'm always on the lookout for you know different bands to listen mm -hmm. to and i think it's you know so when i when i hear about um especially canadian bands like that that's that's really cool i'm definitely uh definitely interested in listening to them for sure Caroline, uh, what have you been enjoying lately? I just finished a book called Funny You Should Ask by Elisa Sussman. Uh, it's a newer book. I believe it was published last year, maybe the year before. But as you know, my pandemic times all run together. But it's a new, new release. And it's based on this idea that a journalist 10 years ago had a very famous 
profile of a celebrity that she spent the weekend with. And uh, it launched her to fame. It cemented him as worthy enough to be the first American James Bond in this fictional universe, which I don't think they did enough with as as a concept but that's okay so she it's been 10 years the piece was written with such ambiguity that it's it's always been kind of a mystery like what actually happened between these two people on this weekend that was c- turned into this profile but also left key things out Now, 10 years later, they have been reunited by the same publication, hoping to capture that same lightning in a bottle. But they are very different people from who they were 10 years ago. They have 10 years of life experience. They have 10 years of resentments. They have uh, 10 years of um, assuming things about each other that may or may not be true. And it, so as you read, you, you, there are little hints dropped along the way at kind of how their, their lives played out and, and different things. It's um, a comedy, I would say romance. And and it, it's really kind of like this wish fulfillment aspect of like, if I could just get, you know, 25 minutes with a celebrity, I could charm them with my practical down to earth sensibilities of being not like you know the other actors or whoever they meet um and then they could just you know fall in love with my winning personality so definitely fulfills that element for me um and i i really enjoyed it i really enjoyed this book that's cool yeah they clearly that actor made a uh, pretty big mark because the fact that they went with an american for a for uh james bond is like that's they wouldn't do that in real life (laughs) no and and see that almost was enough to pull me out of it like right away i was like (laughs) look there's not enough and there is some story around it and him and his friend who is british was up for the role but different things and 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 rumors and innuendo and all of these like elements of it um but i don't i i i don't believe that her profile would have been enough to turn the tide on this anti-american james bond sentiments um i think it might have worked better for me if she had used a fictional movie franchise character and then i wouldn't be like okay hang on that's not the twitter i know and love (laughs) so That part was tough, but the actual rest of it where um, the character of the the journalist or the the essayist, when she is knows that she's shooting herself in the foot by um you know holding on to like petty resentments from a decade ago that part was highly relatable (laughs) nice well it sounds like it's like a future like nancy myers film basically (laughs) yes yeah it definitely has a uh a a rom-com feel um to it that i know i would enjoy to see how about you bryce aside from your amazing experience with the movie we're going to talk about later what else have you been enjoying it's funny because anybody who listens to the show regularly knows that i'm a huge fan of the tv show seinfeld love it this may be news to you, Caroline. I but... was aware. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies to people who listen on a regular basis. But I was so excited to see that we got a new cookbook in our collection called Seinfeld, the official cookbook. Uh, the book has recipes from uh, Julie uh, Julie Tremaine, and the book is actually written by Brendan Kirby. Uh, so... It's funny because, you know, I I saw this book and it was on order. So I like put a hold down on it, came in and, you know, I'm flipping through this cookbook and I'm actually surprised it's taken this long for them to like release an official cookbook around Seinfeld. So obviously all the recipes and everything are based on you know, food that they've talked about on, on Seinfeld. And, uh, I mean, it's, it also kind of makes you think back to like, you know, older, like all these old episodes because food plays such a huge part of the show. And like, it's just something that maybe you don't really 
notice like when you're watching it but i'm flipping through this cookbook i'm like oh my god yeah i remember that episode and this one and uh so for example uh you can uh, pretty much cook anything food related to the show so including uh elaine's big salad a favorite of mine yeah yeah uh tomatoes the size of volleyballs uh the black and white cookie uh fusilli jerry there's nice uh, pasta recipe in there for him uh i like this one george's jerk store shrimp so mm. that's that's a good one mm. um and steinbrenner's calzone so i might actually attempt to make a calzone at home i don't know how well well it will turn out but i mean everything from the shows here uh, newman's jambalaya the marble rye the the turkey uh chili that george orders from the soup nazi it's all here this is this cookbook is brilliant food is at the center of when george he decides to do the opposite of everything so he that's orders right. instead of tuna on tuna on toast he orders chicken uh chicken salad, salad. on rye or something like yeah. that i don't know i i do know the opposite sandwich is in the cookbook, That's, though. Yeah. No, it's absolutely <laughs> true. I saw that you uh, had had checked this book out and got to thinking of all of the food-related moments on the show. And I think it, it makes sense. You know, it, it really is um, about, you know, those day-to-day -day moments of, like, making a whole episode about something very small. And it makes sense that food would play such a big part of it. It reminds me, though, that uh, Jessica Seinfeld married to jerry years ago she had a series of cookbooks and the hook was about like hiding vegetables in them yeah. so your kids would eat them and it's like you know brownies but it's got spinach in it that type of thing so um maybe there's an opportunity for a crossover somewhere i think so definitely but caroline I, like i borrowed obviously the book from us here at the, here at epl i think this is one i'm actually just going to go out and buy because it's like there's so many of these recipes i want to go through and it'll I'll definitely use up my uh, allotted uh, borrowing time if I uh, try to uh, go through everything. So this is a fun one and definitely encourage anybody just to check it out and flip through the different recipes. I like that we kept our kind of picks light this week because uh, we are definitely going to switch energy right now. Yeah, yeah, we are. So uh, like we talked about the top of the show, uh, we're talking all about uh, the locally made uh, horror movie called Skin and Rink. And uh, John Kamech is an associate producer on the movie. He's joining us today. And uh, John, uh, I, for maybe our listeners who aren't familiar with Skin and Rink, uh, can you share what is Skin and Rink and uh, what, what the movie is all about? Sure. So Cinema Rink is a horror film. It's very experimental and unconventional. And the premise of the film is that there's two children um, who wake up in the middle of the night and their father is gone. And then all of the doors and windows in their house have also disappeared. And so like, you know, a lot of kids of a certain generation, you know, they huddle around the TV with their toys, watching old cartoons, you know, with in like, you know, covering up in blankets um, and then slowly they realize that they are not the only thing, like, there is something else in the house with them. And I'll leave it at that because I think beyond that, it's better to go into it with knowing uh, as little as possible. One of my f favorite things has been looking at how the movie has been described. Yeah. Um, the Atlantic calls it a delightful nightmare. Yeah. Um, the New York Times, I think, uh, was was just using all these like experimental dream elements it's I, i've just really loved seeing how people are describing the movie yeah yeah and i think one of my favorites and i think this kind of speaks to the reaction the film's been getting to is that it's an ink blot for your fears because it's so it's so it's been the, the reaction so far has been very divisive to say the least <laughs> and i i really think oh, the film is made in a way that like it like it brings a lot of your own perceptions into the movie um, and a lot of your own fears into the movie. And I, so I think for some people that resonates and for others, it doesn't, uh, but, but I think for the people that it resonates, it resonates hard. Yeah. Um, as I talked about at the top of the show, I, I was at the screening on uh, Friday night and uh, yeah, it's like you kind of said, it's, 
I can definitely see how it is a device, like, you know, the, the reaction to it so far has been divisive, but, um, yeah, it's just, it's nothing, it's like nothing, you know, I've, I've ever seen before. And as somebody who, you know, I've watched a ton, like I love horror movies. Mm-hmm. Like when there's a new one coming out in the theater, I will make a point to go. I absolutely love them. And this is definitely like, I've never, never seen anything like this before mm-hmm. and i think that's that's saying a lot for because you know you think about you're going to a horror movie you're like oh yeah there'll be this axe you know wielding killer or there'll be a ghost mm-hmm. or whatever whatever it is and you kind of know what you're signing up for whereas this one like you have no idea what what you're in for with it and i think that's what that's what i think i love the most yeah. about it was and like you you know like you said i you are watching in my opinion it's like you're watching somebody's nightmare mm-hmm. it's uh it's incredible what you guys did. Yeah, one of my favorite, other, one of my other favorite critic lines is um, that it rewards patience because, I, yeah, I it really is a very slow moving film, but um, you know, I really do think that that is what kind of sets you up, particularly in the last hour of the film, for it to really get under your skin. And I, I'm not exaggerating this at all. So the and so Friday was the third time I've seen it, and that was the first time that I'd seen the final cut. And we can get into talking about kind of that. Um, you know, how that process went, but um, it was my first time seeing the final cut. So, so I saw it with everybody else and I was still like tense the entire film in my seat. Like even after when I got home that night, I was still tense and I went to bed that night, like feeling an uneasiness um, that I really never otherwise feel like I, I do love horror movies as well. Um, but they usually don't get to me. And so it is also a weird feeling that something that you like even worked on in a small part, like it's still like watching it, you know, it still gets to you. Like I saw one comment at one point, like I think one of the reviewers said it was like almost like this film was like birthed out of the unconscious. And so it, it's really interesting th- also thinking about, and I know, I think Kyle said in one interview that, you know, even when he was editing it, he freaked out a couple times, like he, like he saw something and kind of like freaked out a couple times. So that's a really interesting thing to me too, is like, you know, how it can take on a life of its own beyond even the people that worked on it. Yeah. How did you become involved in the, in, in the making of this movie? Uh, So the, the filmmaker and creator and overall creator of the film is Kyle Edward Ball. Um, I didn't know Kyle before the film. He was really, but I knew, I, I connected with the, the crowd funder for the film through friends of friends. Um, so I was a longtime friend with one of the executive producers, Edmund Rotea, and also um, just knew um, others who knew Kyle through the Edmonton film community who were talking about this. When, and, and so I heard about this, you know, this, this, that, you know, oh, one of our friends is, you know, a horror, uh, like a, a YouTube horror film director. And he's want he's trying to make his own feature film, and you know, and I was like, well, that's a, you know, really cool idea. And then when I checked out the crowdfunder and saw the teaser trailer that he'd made, I was like, wow, like this is really, you know, this is great, like this is fantastic. And then also saw his previous work, so I so I you know saw the premise from the teaser trailer and the crowdfunder, and I thought it was a, like excellent premise. And then when I saw his previous work, uh, something like intuitively in me was just like, he's gonna kill this, and. Um, you know, so I, I guess my, my intuition served me well on that one. Um, and so, you know, I was, I was just in on the crowdfunder. I was like, yeah, I, I want to support this movie, but it was really intended as like a local, really to just like a local film. Like, you know, Kyle was, a, Kyle was a local filmmaker making a, a like his first feature film that was just going to be shown locally. I remember at one point, uh, you know, when, when we were talking about it after, it was like, oh, yeah, it'd be cool to do, like, a Metro screening at some point. He's like, oh, yeah, maybe, you know. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> and, yeah, so, you know, then, like, like the, the idea of, like, a, you know, a sold-out Metro screening was never even, like, it, it was never anywhere there. <laughs> and so then after, uh, so then, you know, like, I've had people ask me, like, oh, what, you know, what's an associate producer, you know, and I, I'm like, it really, like, I got, I got onto this honestly by, like, like, I, you know, crowdfunders have the little you know, reward things. Right. And so, so I, you know, I funded the, the, I funded the film at the, you know, associate producer level, um, you know, so, and I was like, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of cool. I'm, I'm, I'm digging this. So, you know, you know, let's go. So then after that, I really kind of, you know, forgot about it. Like I, you know, I was following the crowdfunder a little bit and, you know, people were excited about it within kind of our friend group, um, you know, that people were funding the crowdfunder and then, I kind of forgot about it for a few months, you know. Oh, and I mean, I, I should also say, like, Kyle, um, you know, after I funded it, the associate producer, because I didn't know him at all, um, you know, Kyle reached out and was like, you know, thank you so much 
for, you know, believing in my film. And so that was really kind of how I met him first was, and we, you know, we only talked online for about the first, you know, I only met him in like the end of November, December. So like after like, like this, yeah. Um, I only met him in person then. So um, we'd only been talking online or on the phone between then. And so then um, after, um, after that, I kind of forgot about it, you know, saw when they were filming it on face, like saw shots from when they were filming it on Facebook, you know, like the, like the posts and whatever, but wasn't really thinking about it too much. And then it was about November, 2021. I saw Kyle posting that, you know, the filming was done, um, you know, and he was working on the editing. And then in November, 2021, he reached out to me um, again, unexpectedly and was like, would you be willing to give feedback on, I have the initial cut done. Would you be willing to give me feedback on the first cut? And the reason that he wanted feedback from me was that I was the only person on the crew who hadn't read the shooting script. So, you know, despite the fact that this, you know, a lot of people are calling this a found footage film, the the film did have a script. It was very like, like, and I know even um, like on Friday, I met the director of photography, Jamie McRae, and he was like, Kyle knew exactly what he wanted to do with this, like from the beginning. Um, like everything was like meticulously planned out. They filmed it in a week. And <laughs> so then, yeah, he was like, you know, would you give me feedback on this film? And I was like, you know, of course, like, you know, again, at the time, like it was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm helping out a friend of a friend, just, you know, <laughs> giving feedback on their movie to see what I think. And so then he, he, he actually sent me instructions on how to, on how he'd, pref how he'd prefer me to watch it. Like, you know, like watch it, like totally by, you know, by yourself in the dark, you know, try not to um you know be on your phone or like get distracted you know try and like immerse yourself as much as possible in the film and so i did and you know watch watch that first cut he sent me and like i do very specifically remember the sense of like dread i was like man the sense of dread that this creates is like really palpable and i and there was like a, there was like one scene at least and i i mean i won't say anything to like to ruin it but like there was one scene for sure that had like when i watched that first cut where i like basically had my head in my hands like like completely on edge and i would say there was one one scene as well where it almost felt like it was like hallucinogenic like the like like the room was kind of like like waving you know like as i as i was watching it and there are a couple parts of the movie where i i do get like a very weird like tearing up feeling so I think it's, you know, it, I think it operates on the like visceral sensory level. Like, I think it goes beyond kind of your, I've, I've seen, I've seen reviews saying that it goes beyond your defenses. <laughs> like, like, and, and even, even other horror film fans who've said like, I've watched like hundreds of scary movies, you know, I feel like I've like had this like, like, you know, iron armor on around scary movies, but like this penetrated my defenses. So I was, I was curious, um, now, have you had a chance to actually visit the house that the movie was filmed in? I have not, no. And and, and so an important part about that is it, it, Kyle filmed it in his childhood home. Yes. Uh, and his parents still live there. Like, it's still yeah. their house. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could see this almost becoming like a new Edmonton tourist attraction, oh. just the way the movie's taking off. People are like, where's the Skinner Rink house? Right, yeah. And yeah. can I go into the basement? <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and I know, I think he has, he has like kept it uh, like, like he, he doesn't want it to turn into that. Um, yeah. you know, I, like I, because it is still his parents' house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> For sure. So you, you've obviously, you know, you've talked about like when you're able to actually, uh, watch, watch the movie and like, when did you first, I guess, see that this movie was going to be something special? Like, obviously, you know, you watched a cut of it and you're like, this is really cool. I'm glad to be part of it. But like, you know, it's, I mean, as anybody knows, it's, it's tough to not only get a movie made, but to get eyeballs on it. So when did everything really start to come together? Right. So, so after it was done, I don't, I don't know exactly how this, how this came together, but I know that, that it got accepted into Fantasia Film Festival, um, which for anyone who doesn't know Fantasia, it's an, uh, it, it's like a horror and kind of alt film festival uh, in Montreal. And it's one of the biggest internationally. Um, like I know Kyle mentioned, like basically like for the, for the horror community, like getting into Fantasia is like getting into cans. Like it's, um, like it's a, it's a huge deal to get into, to get your film accepted into Fantasia. And so 
that was really big. And I remember when we posted that, I was like, you know, wow, that's incredible, you know. <laughs> but again, I, I think at that point, like we like it still wasn't really in we still didn't really know this was going to happen. Um, to me, like one of the things where I, I think my mind started to change, like this could be different was when I st started seeing some of the reactions people were having, especially at Fantasia. And, you know, Fantasia is obviously like a, like, like the people who would go to Fantasia are like, are like horror, you know, connoisseurs, right? Like these are like, they, and like people who are really uh, like into it, at Kyle and Edmund, who one of the producers went to Fantasia, and I know that they said like the, the audience was like stunned when they saw it. And some of the reactions out of Fantasia were really like, like some of the initial reviews were incredible. And I, I think what was what was amazing for me was when people were saying, you know, like, like, this is like the scariest movie I've ever seen. And like, you know, this movie made me cry. Like I, I was like shocked to see those reactions. Like, it's like, wow, like this is really impacting people deeply. And so that, I think that was when I started to know it was going to like, you know, something was going to come from this. Then what it was still on the festival circuit. And so, and then there was a festival in Europe. Um, basically there was a technical glitch for the festival that allowed the film to be downloaded. Um, so the film was pirated and I know this was very hard, uh, on Kyle, um, because that can really, um, that can really impact your chance of getting a deal as a, like a local oh, filmmaker, sure. you know, um, um, and he was actually, he was working on the shutter deal at that point. And so he was very concerned that this was going to impact, you know, that deal. And from what I know, um, like I, I had, I didn't have any role in that, but, but from what I know from, um, hearing him speak about it, like the shutter people were fantastic. They, you know, they really like moved mountains to, um, to get, to move the film up. Um, so the film was originally supposed to be released, uh, Halloween 2023. Um, but then, you know, it, it really started, I think what also drove the momentum of the film was after it was pirated, like people were talking about it online and, you know, people saying like, this is the scariest thing I've seen, but then you couldn't watch it anywhere, right? It was only playing a very select couple festivals. So then it was kind of, you know, driving this momentum of, you know, this, and especially because of the type of the movie, it's kind of this like, you know, tape that you can't see <laughs> type, type deal. And so then it was, and then around, like, because of that around, I think September, October, it went viral on TikTok. There was a couple like TikTok influencers who posted uh, like really positive reviews saying that it like had really terrified them. So there, you know, then there's, there's hundreds of thousands or millions of views on TikTok. And I think that was really the point where it's like, wow, like we had not expected anything like this to happen. Um, and then, you know, on Reddit, like people were talking about it on Reddit. Um, I know it really, like the film really, you know, was kind of born out of the internet um, in, in many, in kind of many different ways. Um, be, you know, because Kyle has his, Kyle has a YouTube channel called Bite Size Nightmares, which is where he kind of honed what he does, um, where he, he would get people's nightmares. And actually that's an important point about the kind of the origins of the film too. Like he would get people to submit their nightmares and then he would make a short about it. Yeah. So, so all the Bite Size Nightmares, you can still check out on his YouTube page. And then the genesis of Skinamarink was really that he, he kept hearing that, you know, the, um, the same nightmare, like the most common nightmare that people were having was that, you know, I'm alone in my house, my parents are gone and there's this thing after me, you know? And so he, that was really like, that's really interesting. And I, I've told him like, you know, I, I really think, think like this film almost taps into something in like the collective unconscious, you know, like the, that, that there's, so, uh, there's something at least within a proportion of people where this is like a primal fear. And I think that's why it really like hits a, like a, like a good chunk of people. Um, one that's, it's a, to me, it's a really fascinating discussion of like why it hits some people okay. and not others. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, just to finish there and then just to finish about kind of the release, um, you know, after it went, it was like maybe late November when we, you know, found out, you know, the, about the AMC deal and then the AMC deal with Shudder and the theatrical release with IFC Midnight got announced in early December. And that was when we were like, wow, <laughs> like, yeah. uh, like this is, and then I think even, I think even then, you know, like, well, we were like, well, you know, this will, you know, it'll be a small limited theatrical release. Right. And then, you know, now we're at more than 600 theaters. I, it's, it, I think it might, it might be more than 700 now. We just found yeah. out this morning that like the Prince Charles Theater Cinema in the UK is adding screenings because they've had such a response. And there's been there's been sold out screenings in Toronto, New York, and LA. 
you know, there's like, uh, and uh, there's been pe- like, it's like people are de- like, deme- like asking online, like, like, you know, like posting to their local theater saying, I want to see this. So yeah, that's, it's just, it's very surreal. It's been totally surreal to see it take off. Yeah, that's, that's so cool. And yeah, I'm so happy for everybody involved in, in the movie. That's such a, that's such a, an incredible story just about how, um, like it is, it's hard to get people to like make a movie and then have people see it and discover it. But, you know, that part about TikTok, you know, we've talked on the show about like book talk and how, right. you know, a lot of these older books too will kind of get like rediscovered uh, almost on, on TikTok. And, you know, all it takes is, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, people with large followings mm-hmm. and influencers to mention it. And uh, yeah, just kind of, uh, it can kind of grow from there. I know after I watched the movie, I went home and I was just, I'm like, I'm going to go on Reddit and, you know, see, and I could just typed in skin of rink in the search bar and see what would pop up. And, you know, I kind of expected it to show up on, you know, maybe the movies thread or the horror thread. And it did, yeah. but it also popped up on all these other threads as well. And there was just like, and not only that, but, you know, I'm looking at the movie section. It's like, almost a thousand comments Mm -hmm. so it's like you know people are discovering it and commenting on it and i i just think that's that's uh that's so cool yeah it's it's honestly this past weekend especially after the the world like well the the theatrical premiere on friday it's been very hard to pull myself away from twitter (laughs) just like seeing kind of all the reactions that are coming in like rain a complete range of reactions like like half and one star reviews of people you know saying that they were bored that they hated it um that you know and then four and five star reviews of people saying you know this is a horror masterpiece like a like landmark in horror like the Blair Witch was and that's why I really I think that like ink blot test for your fears is a really accurate description you know like it's it's so I I really think Kyle produced a work of art with this you know like like because it's like it there's so different reactions and everybody is having like a like is seeing different things and you know seeing having different interpretations and people are talking about it online um i mean a a, a really exciting thing to me is just there well there's so many exciting things but like you know people talking uh, just people people excited to go to the movies again you know after like like seeing on twitter like people saying like you know i bought my ticket for friday i'm like psyched to see this um i feel like that was sort of lost in you know through the pandemic um for sure through the pandemic and then also just with like the move to streaming you know like people would talk about like certain um you know certain things coming out but you wouldn't really talk about like you know i'm going to the theater friday with friends you know like and then everybody's people are talking about it after the film so like seeing that happen again like people excited to go to the movies um and to for it to happen with like an independent film is 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 phenomenal another thing i I wanted to mention that i'm I'm really loving seeing is like people people uh, in their reviews talking about um like things from their childhood that that terrified them that the film evoked that they're like i haven't thought about this in decades and it brought it up um that's really incredible (laughs) yeah for sure like there's i mean i'm not spoiling anything here but you know in the movie there's this uh obviously there's like a TV and they're showing this really old cartoon. And um, I don't know what it is about. It's funny. You, you mentioned about, you know, people watch it and they see different things and it invokes, you know, different thoughts and feelings, but there's something about those old cartoons. Like it's just really creepy. <laughs> like, <laughs> the music and the animation and just, yeah, they're like, I don't know. Do you know kind of what year it's from? It's like the night. It's, I don't know. It looks like it's like a thirties or forties cartoon kind of thing. Like really old. It's not Disney, but that type of animation. Yeah. The cartoons are from the thirties, I believe. Yeah. And they're all public access, um, like public domain cartoons. Thinking about the experience of watching a movie too. Um, I mean, you, you described how Kyle had his instructions for when you needed, you were first sitting down, you know, and the one that gets me is like, don't be on your phone. And I very recently described a movie as you could tell I was really into it because I set my phone down while I was watching it. Um, but when you were at the movies, there's that more active 
surrendering of yourself almost to the movie and i have seen this a little bit online in some of the the discussions around skin and Marink. It has been some people saying this is the perfect movie to see in a theater with an audience and experience it collectively and then you've got a couple saying like this is the perfect movie to sit alone in your house and be in complete darkness and i think that it's great that like it, you'll be able to have done both of those things mm -hmm. if you so choose on this. Yeah, and, and I was wondering too, before I went to the premiere, like how well is this going to work in a theater with a like, you know, especially a packed theater with like so many other people and people are moving and, you know, coughing and, you know, you can hear people breathing. Um, and I and I mean, I, it still worked for me. It, like, like the film works extremely well for me at least. And uh, I mean, one kind of, cool thing maybe you noticed Bryce when um we were there for the premiere was um at one point during the film like somebody turned their phone on and it was like shining like a blue light up on the wall of the theater and it almost matched the blue in that scene like that particular scene that was on at the time and I was like whoa like that is you know really like that seems planned like it was like really creepy um, that was not planned for sure. Like, but, but, okay. you know, you, you get, you get stuff like that, you know, in a theater experience that you wouldn't get at home. And then you, you know, you have other things in a, you know, a home experience where, you know, you're hearing the creaks of your house, you know, you're alone. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so I do think it work. it can work differently in both. Yeah, definitely. And, um, yeah, the one thing too, I noticed that the premiere is like nervous laughter yes. and Dumb. what i mean by that is like something scares you you think you see something and it's just like your heart races and i've i've seen that obviously you know in a few kind of theater settings where you know something's been really scary or there's been some jump scares and that's how you know people are having a good time when there is you know at a, at a horror movie it's like when there is that kind of nervous laughter and uh you know, also to, you know, kind of think about it when I was when I was watching the movie and I totally agree that like if you can like go see this in, in the theater, mm -hmm. like you need to really, you know, my opinion anyway, like be in that dark setting. And uh, I don't know how it'll come across if, you know, some people I know, like my wife, for example, for watching a horror movie, it's got to be on like a Saturday, Sunday afternoon. Lights are all on and everything. And. Uh, I would be curious to watch it that way. I don't think it would have the same impact on me, though, as, uh, you know, unless you're in that really, really dark setting with it. What's, you know, Variety did the story on it. It's, you know, obviously, you know, it's playing at Fantasia and those are for like, you know, really big, like you said, horror connoisseurs. And, you know, Variety does this article and it's like, obviously, like hitting more of the mainstream now. Yeah. yeah. And, uh I guess, like, what's next for the movie now? Like, mainstream audiences are starting to discover it. But, uh, like, has there been any talk of, uh, like, a sequel? Because <laughs> that's that's the horror thing to do is there's there's a hit movie. There's got to there's got to be a sequel. So has there been any talk of that or like what's next? No, no, no sequel talks. Um, I, I, <laughs> I think it. Yeah, I don't think it's a, it was not a film that lends itself very well to a sequel. I think it's like kind of a singular. It's a singular project. And I think, yeah, I think for now, we're just kind of riding this wave of like, what's going to happen with it over the next while. Um, because it, like, it just had the theatrical premiere. Um, you know, we just found today, like, there, yeah, there's there's more screenings being added in certain places. It'll be out on Shutter February 2nd. Um, so, you know, oh, wow. then it will be like, you know, thousands, you know, maybe millions more of people um, seeing it. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that will cause like another wave of interest once it's out on Shutter. That's that's so cool. Uh, I you know kind of think back to it when you said uh, at the beginning where it's like oh you know you think we'll do a screening at the metro maybe and I picture you know you kind of thought like oh it'll be some family and friends and that'll that'll be it but uh, you know fast forward to uh, Friday the thirteenth two thousand twenty three and there's a packed house of the metro lined up you know, around the block almost, um, you know, standing outside in minus 15 weather, just everybody was so excited to get in. Uh, you know, I will say too about that screening, one of my biggest pet peeves about going to the movies, and I only, only find this on like opening night with certain films, like, you know, your big Marvel ones or whatever, people clap at the end. And I don't know why, but I'm just, it's a huge, it's a huge pet peeve of mine. I'm like, you know what? 
uh, Robert Downey Jr. is not here tonight. Well, at this screening, it was so cool because not only did we get clapping from the audience during the opening credits, which is really neat, but you know what? I, for the first time, actually clapped at the end of a movie because it was so cool because the cast was there, the crew, and it was just a really cool, really cool experience. And yeah, I just wanted to share that anyway. I really, it's, it feels like this is like a once in a lifetime thing. At least, you know, for me, like, like when, when will a film that you had like even a small part to play in, you know, go viral like this, um, you know, and, and that you're able to have this experience seeing it take off, you know, this, it probably, it probably will not happen again. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy it while it lasts. Yeah, so, sure. uh, yeah, it's such a it's such an awesome Edmonton story, and uh, yeah, we're so uh, so happy to uh, yeah have you on today with us and uh, chat all about it. But uh, before we wrap up today, uh, let's get into our quick roundtable questions. Some uh, fun ones just to wrap things up. So, uh, of course, Skin and Rink was filmed as you as you mentioned, uh, John, in uh, director Kyle Edward Ball's childhood home here in Edmonton. Uh, where else in Edmonton would you like to see a horror movie filmed or set? Uh, well, I don't know if you could film an entire uh, film there, but the the thing that jumped out to me particularly when I saw this was, um, you know, the talus balls. Um, I mean, I th- you could probably at least get some interesting shots using the mirroring there. Um, that was what's that was what came to mind very first, you know. The uh, the setting of future Edmonton political thriller bestseller, No Way Dome. Caroline, how about you? High Level Bridge Streetcar. Mm, that's, oh, that's a good one. Pretty yeah. good. Uh, both like the idea of being maybe immobile up so high, but then also mm-hmm. there are some pre- creepy when you're going like in and out of the, the tunnel-y parts of it um, and just this... I don't know. It's it's creepy and like once I was on and like there was an electrical issue and like there was sparks and stuff and uh, this idea of like you feel like you should be able to get off but you can't. I don't know. That's scary to me. Yeah, almost maybe a little bit like the Mister Rogers going into like imagination land mm-hmm. type thing. I think I think we got a movie here, Caroline. We always do. We always do. <laughs> Overdue fines. John, yeah. if you're looking to get involved in a new movie, we we come up with million dollar ideas on on overdue fines all the time. Including, I don't know if you remember Bryce, but the episode where we had multiple ideas for rebooting Gilligan's Island. That's right. Yeah, totally forgot all yeah. about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, Bryce, where's your movie set? Uh, you know what? I got to go Fort Edmonton Park mm. for this one. Uh, there's been lots of movies actually filmed there and TV shows and everything, but. Um, uh, there's something about kind of the actual fort part mm-hmm. that I think I think you could set up like a really cool. I know it's been done a million times, but a really cool like zombie movie down there. But it's set in like the 1800s or 1700s, maybe. So I think there's something there that that would be my setting anyway. All right, so getting back to our horror roots, um, I'm a big horror fan, John. I know you are, Caroline. I think you're. Yeah, on the on the fence with it, but uh, Caroline, I'm going to start with you. Yeah. Do you remember like what the first horror movie uh, you ever, like you ever watched was? I had to Google to confirm that it did like be classified as a horror movie. I think it might have been Psycho. Okay. Yeah. I think it might have been Psycho. I probably would have been mm, twelve. I I don't know <laughs> that I would have watched anything before that. John, how about you? So I, I, I can't remember the first horror movie that I watched, but I guess I thought of three horror experiences that I wanted to talk about like, that were key for me, I think. So first one, I was four years old, around four, and uh, my, my dad took me to see The NeverEnding Story Part 2, which is not a horror film, of course. Uh, but I do still have like a vague recollection of this. Um, there's these, and I haven't never seen the film again, but there's these, like, there were these like lobster monsters in the film and I was like terrified. Like my dad told me I was like hyperventilating. He had to take me out of the theater. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and I, I, I do still have kind of this like weird impression of that in my head, um, even though I was so young. Um, so that was probably my first like overt horror experience. Then the next one for me as an experience was 
um, I was probably about eight or nine and seeing the original It um, with, oh. the, yeah, the, like Tim Curry as Tim Pennywise. Tim Curry one. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, the first half of that for sure is still phenomenal. Um, partic- it's the sewer scene. Uh, the, the scene where he's in the sewer talking to the boy and he's, you know, he says, you know, you all, we all float down, ev- or they all float down eventually, right? <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> that was, you know, that just like drove me wild when I was there I, my dad would say that to me and i'm like stop saying that <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> and then the third one when i was a bit older probably 16 and this is probably one of the real really only one one of the only films where i like lay awake at night and couldn't fall asleep was jacob's ladder um i don't know if, have you ever seen jacob's ladder no actually oh. i have a hold down for it i, I oh. want to watch that excellent yeah really excellent movie um and yeah that one really messes with your head uh, especially the first time you watch it. And uh, so that creeped me out for sure when I was a teenager. And um, now I, I've seen it a few times. It's really like a beautiful movie. Like when, when you you see kind of the, the arc of the entire film, um, it's, it's really fantastic. But still, there's still parts that are like very, you know, unnerving. Bryce, what about you? I had to think about this. And uh, so I guess two I remember from childhood. I don't remember which one I saw first. But these aren't like, I don't think they're technically classified as horror movies. One was Return to Oz, which we've mentioned on the show before, just being so creepy. I remember my parents taking me and my younger brother to it when it was first released, I think in like 85. And I remember them leaving the theater with us because it was so scary. We could barely Oh, I thought they would let you there <laughs> i remember they sat us down they took yeah. off <laughs> they went and saw romancing in the stone or whatever else was in the theater at the time and we were stuck watching that would be a kind of a that would in itself would be a scary movie or else gremlins as well mm, kind of around mm. that same but uh the one i think like really like first rated r horror movie i remember watching as a kid uh was over at a friend's house and they had it recorded was uh, maximum overdrive Mm. the stephen king directed movie about uh machines taking over the world uh not the greatest horror movie but it's i you know that's a kind of a sentimental favorite of Mm. mine anyway Mm -hmm. so that that's a good one those are the best ones the sentimental favorites Thank you so much for joining us today, John. Um, where can people go to learn more about Skin and Rink? So the official website is skinamarink.com. Um, that has, you can find the trailer and the synopsis for the film. That only has the U.S. screenings on it. So for anyone else, like in Canada, who wants to see, they'd have to check their local listings. And otherwise, I think the probably best place to, to read about the film is like Reddit or Twitter or... <laughs> you know, these social media websites where it is taking off. I think that's probably where you'll see, you know, the most interesting comments um, and, you know, see the discussion about the film. Great. And is there anything else you would like to plug for our listeners or let them know about? Yeah. So one of, one of the other hats I wear outside of the, outside of being a library assistant um, is I work on a, uh, a climate project called the Gigaton Challenge, um, where we're trying to um, find a practical way of reducing CO2 um, and building teams around the world um, that are trying to reduce CO2 directly. Um, so if, if that interests you at all, um, I, would, I would recommend checking out um, the website gigaton.co. Um, yeah, so that's, that's like another, another hat I wear of my, you know, all these weird hats that like all these weird things that I, you know, get, get involved in. Like I, like I'm, I'm definitely distractible. So I'm kind of like, you know, I'll kind of like go in a bunch of different directions, like working on like little things that interest me. <laughs> Love it. That's awesome. That's a, that's a great cause. That's cool that you're involved in it. So, of course, we hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you haven't yet, we encourage you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And even more importantly, please tell a friend about the show. And, of course, we'd love to hear from our listeners. So you can email us at podcast at epl.ca and let us know what you thought about Skinamarink this episode or maybe give us any future episode ideas. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.